Hello everyone, namaste. How, I hope you're having a great weekend. Today we are joined by one of our very special guests, Dr. Baxter Bell. Dr. Baxter Bell has been with us once before, uh, maybe two or three months back. And uh, he is going to talk to us about CLBP. You must be wondering what is CLBP? It is chronic low back pain or just low, low back pain. A lot of us are doing a lot of screen related activities especially in lockdown and partial and lockdown, unlocking phase. And a lot of us are facing a problem of backache and we do not know what to do and if to take any medication. Uh, the doctors, you are really afraid of going to because of the, the nature of the COVID pandemic. So let's learn from Dr. Baxter Bell of what he has to tell us and how he has used yoga to provide some solace, some uh, help and some treatment so I'm going to formally introduce uh, him to all of you as a part of our continuous integrative health education series. This particular talk is going to focus on learning about the techniques of yoga and the science-based applications and experiences from the horse's mouth, from people who've been practicing, teaching, and these are all qualified practitioners. So Dr. Baxter Bell is an MD. He has been actively deep deepening his understanding of the power of yoga since making the stress reducing move from a career as a busy family doctor to that of a yoga therapist or a yoga educator or a yoga teacher and a medical acupuncturist. So not only yoga, he's also an acupuncturist. Baxter is a co-author of the book Yoga for Healthy Aging, as well as co-founder and contributing writer to the blog Yoga for Healthy Aging. Isn't that interesting? As well as his new blog that he runs, it's called the What's on Your Mind. Baxter has served as the director of Piedmont Yoga Studio, forgive me if I uh, pronounce that badly, uh, deep yoga program for many years. He's also on faculty for several teacher training and yoga therapy programs around the country, US. Baxter is a certified yoga therapist, a level of training denoted by CIAYT. You must be wondering what that is. It is International Association of Yoga Therapy, and he serves on the board of the International Association of Yoga Therapists, as I just mentioned, and he teaches public uh, with the specialty back care yoga classes in Oakland, Berkeley, California, from where he's joined today. And he also does workshops and retreats around the country, as well in also not only in his country, but also internationally. He teaches a healing, nurturing style of Hatha Yoga that you're all familiar with, Balancing a desire for action with a need to quiet the mind or to quieten the mind, whatever you, as you want to interpret it. Emphasizing the qualities of curiosity and meditation in the practice. So we are all really curious to know what we have in store for her, for us. Um, but before that, I must tell you, his students say that they appreciate his clarity of instruction and playful sense of humor. I recall last time we had in our show we were not so used to Zoom, and we tried to. Uh, play with the Facebook and he was able to uh, work around the problem and very smoothly and in a very uh, non uh, struggling fashion was able to run the program through Facebook. So uh, welcome Dr. Baxter to this program. It has been continuing for the last seven months. We haven't given up. We want to listen to what you have to say. Namaste and welcome to our program. We look forward to hearing from you and to listening to your thoughts. And I'm, I'm going to switch off my video and I'm going to be around. Thank you, Akshay. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me today, everyone. It's great to be back. <clears throat> and I wanted to just mention that I have a personal connection, <clears throat> excuse me, a personal connection to the topic today, yoga for chronic low back pain. Um, for many years, I was a family physician in the United States. And one of the most common reasons for people coming to my office was because they were having a, a, a bout of lower back pain. And although I had the power of the prescription pad, I could give them medications, I could refer them to a physical therapist, I really felt quite limited in how I could positively impact their lower back pain. So for me, it was actually a source of a little bit of frustration in my professional work. Um, about five years into my private practice in medicine, I started practicing yoga myself as a, as a beginning student. And over time, I came to discover that there was quite a bit of research being done on yoga for lower back pain. And we're going to talk about that today. So when I eventually made the shift from my private practice as a family doctor to that of being a yoga instructor, 
and educator and eventually a yoga therapist, uh, I was thrilled to be able to share with my students the tools of yoga to impact their lower back pain. And I've actually been doing that now for almost 20 years in the United States, in Oakland, California. Um, and so I have a lot of uh, personal anecdotal experience with this. And today I'll be sharing with you some of the um, research and information I think that's relevant uh, so that we can feel very confident when we design a protocol or a therapeutic program for our clients and patients that we actually are providing them with something that's quite valuable for their ongoing uh, health and the improvement of their chronic low back pain. So I'd like to share with you uh, a few slides and we'll do that now. So if you'll give me just one moment to pull that up for you. So I've entitled our talk Yoga for Chronic Low Back Pain and I've shared with you both my email and my website in case you'd like to reach out after this program is done for further conversation, please do so. <clears throat> Always happy to talk to colleagues around the world. And Akshay mentioned that I lead retreats around uh, the world. In about four years ago, I brought a fairly large group of folks from the United States to uh, visit India and do yoga in India. And it was one of the highlights of the retreats I've led. So I feel very blessed to have had several trips to India to uh, uh, meet and, and work with a lot of folks there. It's a wonderful place and I, I hope to be back once the pandemic is over. So, although most of us probably feel fairly healthy most of the time, um, the, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that for a lot of folks in the next couple of months, they're likely to have some low back pain. So research has demonstrated that over the next three months, 30% of folks uh, are gonna report a, a bout of low back pain, even if they've been relatively healthy. So it's quite a large number of people. And this is probably not only applies in the United States, but around the world. And unfortunately, of that group of 30% of people who have a bout of low back pain, up to 20% of those people will go on to develop chronic or persistent low back pain. Unfortunately, as we get older, the uh, prevalence of low back pain increases with our increasing age, and women are slightly ahead of men, and this may be just simply due to the, the fact that women have longer lifespans in most uh, uh, countries. Um, and my apologies to the men that are joining us today for that uh, uh, downer information. <laughs> and we have to keep in mind that low back pain can be quite complex. So it's, uh, I don't want to simplify things today, and we'll talk about some of the different categories very briefly that people might uh, fall into when it comes to back pain. Some other reasons that you might want to um, uh, continue to focus your learning on chronic low back pain, in the United States at least, up to 80% of adults are going to have at least one significant bout of of pain, low back pain in their lifetime. And this would be a persistent period of pain that probably leads to a certain amount of disability. Um, and so really that means most people, um, uh, at least in, in my country, are gonna experience some low back pain. And it turns out that worldwide, so this is, a, of course, this is gonna include India, worldwide, uh, low back, chronic low back pain is the leading cause <clears throat> of physical disability. Now, of that, group of people that will have chronic low back pain, it turns out that 85% of those folks are gonna have nonspecific as the tag word on their low back pain, meaning no specific underlying cause could be identified once they went through a, a workup with their healthcare team. However, 15% of low back pain will have a specific cause. Um, as I mentioned, uh, as a family doctor, I saw lots of people with back pain every day. In fact, some days it felt like it was the the primary reason why people came in after respiratory infections. Uh, in the U.S., it's about the fifth most common cause for a visit to, to the doctor. Um, and, and it's also the most common reason why uh, patients will try integrative or complementary therapies like yoga. Um, in terms of classifying back pain, if back pain is around for only six weeks or less, it's usually uh, referred to as acute low back pain. And if it's around for more than 12 weeks or three months, it's referred to as chronic low back pain. There's a changing thought process on this that actually back pain that lingers is a, on a continuum and not just these black and white uh, uh, doorways that you step through uh, in time. Uh, so it's, again, a fairly complex condition, but we're going to try and just hit some of the highlights uh, in this talk today. Now, you know, a lot of people that I work with are sometimes nervous about going to see their regular uh, Western allopathically trained doctor when they have an issue. 
but really people with lower back pain should be encouraged by those of us that might be in the field of yoga and yoga therapy to talk with their physicians because as, as I mentioned, 15% of those folks are going to have an underlying cause that we probably should identify because it might actually impact the kind of yoga we would design for them to do, right? So I think this is very important to keep in mind. I'm going to give you a, a bigger list of underlying causes in just a moment, but there's a few listed here um, on, this, on this slide. So keeping in mind again that 85% of chronic low back pain is nonspecific, 15% is um, has an underlying cause. I went ahead and kind of gave you some categories here of what those include. So we have congenital problems. An example of that would be spina bifida, which is not that uncommon as it turns out. Uh, injuries probably might be the largest group of underlying causes, strains, traumatic injuries, things like that. And then something I see a great deal in my yoga therapy practice is degenerative problems. In particular, degenerative disc disease and arthritis. Very, very common in the general population and sometimes associated with chronic low back pain. Uh, a little less common are things like nerve and spinal cord problems. I do see um, a decent number of people with spinal stenosis, either in the central spinal column or in the small openings on the sides of the uh, spine where the spinal nerves emerge. And then some non-spine sources of pain are always important to keep in mind, such as kidney stones or pregnancy or tumors that might cause back pain as, as a symptom of, of that underlying problem. So again, just a reminder that it's a good idea to refer your clients to the healthcare team to rule out those conditions because as a yoga therapist, I want that information. I want to know that those folks have been to see their doctor. I'd like to know what their diagnosis is if they have one. If it's nonspecific, great. I have some great tools I can work with. But if it's spinal stenosis and I'm aware that, um, you know, they have to sometimes sit down after short periods of break to release the pain in their back or that forward bends actually provide them more benefit and more pain relief, that might be a different recommendation than I would give to someone with nonspecific low back pain. So again, really good to get that underlying information whenever possible. Uh, some of the risk factors for developing both acute and chronic low back pain I think are worth mentioning because again, as it turns out, our yoga practices can have a significant impact and we have lots of studies now that show this. So we can't change the fact that someone's aging, but my work uh, on yoga for healthy aging certainly indicates that we can influence the course of aging. So people can maintain better health as they get older if they're involved in a regular yoga therapy program. Fitness level, an obvious place where yoga can have a benefit. There's now several studies that show that we can impact unhealthy weight gain. Um, you know, depending on someone's uh, tendency or kosha uh, predominance of kapha, pitta, <clears throat> or vata, um, we might be able to impact the healthy weight of an individual. Uh, we can't do a lot about genetics, but we know that yoga can impact epigenetics, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, Job-related factors, we might be able to change a person's perspective um, and make them more mindful of how they're uh, working in their workplace and therefore lower their chance of hurting their back. There's lots of studies now that show that yoga can be beneficial for improving things like depression and anxiety, also changing unhealthy habits like smoking, and also dealing with psychological factors like one's ability to deal with the stressors in one's life in a healthier way. Unfortunately, the number one um, risk factor for a future episode of back pain is having had a, an episode already. Can't do much about that. That's already in the past. So I did want to mention this particular text for those of you that might not be familiar with this. This was published in, I believe, 2016, came out in the United States. The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare. And every one of the editors is a physician, um, both in the United States and Shirley Tellis actually, I believe, still works in India, does her research there. And they compiled all of the uh, relevant research on yoga for health conditions uh, under one roof in this one book. So if you don't have this already and you are a healthcare professional who's interested in the research done on yoga, this is an invaluable resource. It turns out that they have an entire chapter in this seminal work uh, on yoga for uh, back conditions. It happens to be chapter 8. 
Uh, and yoga, uh, they, they conclude that yoga can be used as an alternative or an adjunct to all other allopathic approaches to addressing chronic low pack, back pain. They cite, uh, after reviewing all of the literature that was available at that time, uh, and there is quite a bit of research that's been done on yoga for nonspecific low back pain, they actually settled on 12 well-conducted studies from the United States, the United Kingdom, and India. Uh, in addition, they noted that the, a lot of non-yoga research has shown that things like aerobic exercise and resistance training are both equally effective in addressing yo yoga ba uh, uh, back pain, not, not yoga back pain, uh, and that yoga shares qualities of those particular types of treatment. Also, that non-yoga research demonstrated the evidence that relaxation techniques and stretching also have positive impacts on low back pain. And of course, yoga involves both of those um, aspects. So what about some specific research on yoga for chronic low back pain? Well, um, there's a, if, if you look at some of the general um, conclusions that were drawn uh, by the authors of that book and also other studies, yoga has been found to be now equivalent to the gold standard uh, for treatment for low back pain over the years, which has been physical therapy, physical therapy at least in the United States. Um, and there's now been several studies to confirm that yoga is on equal footing with uh, physical therapy. And it turns out that yoga actually has an advantage over physical therapy that it's been shown to improve stress perception and sleep quality in those with chronic low back pain. It's also been found in some studies to be very cost effective. There were several studies done in the United Kingdom that actually showed that um, the cost of care was lowered and that the, uh, it significantly lowered the rate of missed days at work. Uh, there was also one study that showed that one class of yoga with an instructor was as effective as two classes per week. Now, I will say that in those studies, this, the study subjects were also encouraged to have a home practice that they did on most days of the weeks in, in addition to their in-person classes with the teacher. So it may be the fact that they were actually doing yoga most days of the week that was more important than how many classes per week with an instructor is important. Uh, there was also a really great group of studies that was done by a researcher named, I, I believe it's Robert Sapier. Uh, he's a physician in the Boston, Massachusetts area of the United States, and he did something called the Back to Health Trial. Um, his first study, I believe, was in 2013, and he did a series of studies that were interconnected in their, in their um, focus. Um, and he compared yoga with physical therapy with an education control group. And he also wanted to assess the feasibility of using yoga for underserved communities in the Boston area that normally wouldn't have access or necessarily think about uh, using yoga for chronic low back pain. And it was discovered that yoga was equivalent in benefit to the gold standard of physical therapy that I mentioned on that previous slide. So this was a huge shift in our understanding of how powerful uh, yoga tools could be. And I've given you the link here so you can uh, look at the specifics of that study in more detail. Um, I thought it might be helpful to share with folks uh, a sample protocol from that study. Um, this, uh, the way the study was designed is that the, um, that the uh, study subjects that were in the uh, arm of the study that involved yoga uh, <clears throat> would meet on a weekly basis with an instructor and for a um, uh, several week period, three to four weeks, they would have a similar class presented each week. And then, so actually for, for the weeks one through three, it's right on, on your sheet there, on the screen there. Um, they would do some uh, mixture of the poses that are listed on the screen, including being uh, given a short um, uh, guided relaxation and instruction on uh, initial breath work. Um, and then they were released home to do their home practice. And then after the three week period, they would have a new set of practices given, and they did that for four modules. So they were actually uh, working with the instructor for about three months. Um, and so what I think is interesting is, even though they have this group of four poses that they call the yoga postures, actually everything on the practice is considered part of the yoga asana practice. However, they classify them as warm-ups, and when you're doing your warm-ups, if they were going to do this as a home practice after they had their formal practice, they would pick three or four of the warm-up poses to do first, and then they would do all four 
of these yoga postures. So Balasana or child's pose, Shalabhasana, locust pose, the Sphinx pose, which is of course a variation of Cobra, and then a bridge pose were the four standard poses that were in every practice. And then they would do two or three of the cool down poses and follow that with a Shavasana. Um, so they could um, mix and match a little bit and change the practice a little bit from day to day, but this was their essential template. Um, what's so wonderful about this particular study that is that uh, for everyone who's joining me from India or anywhere in the world for this talk, you can actually go online and get access to their teacher instruction manual that they developed for the teachers that guided the clients through this program. You can also get access to all of these um, templates of the sequence protocols that they utilized. And so you can start to work with those in your own practice and then share those with your communities if you like. So it's quite um, a wonderful service that they've done in not only doing the research that showed that their yoga therapy protocol was as effective as physical therapy offered on a regular basis, uh, but that they've made that available to the public so that we all can then utilize that and share that with, uh, with the folks that we work with. Um, um, I would also mention that there's some other good news that's come out in the last couple of years in the United States at least, is that based on the strength of the scientific evidence and the research that's been done on yoga for chronic low back pain, the American College of Physicians in the United States in 2017 changed their recommendations on first line approaches to chronic low back pain. They started to move away from recommending pharmacology and moved to recommending non-invasive <clears throat> approaches for chronic low back pain as the first option in working with patients for physicians that were trying to decide how to approach chronic low back pain. And yoga was placed in that group of primary approaches. So a huge shift in, um, in our mindset on how we approach um, treating back pain in the United States just over the last three years. There were also several well-done studies in the United States at the Veterans uh, Administration, or the VA, working with veterans of, of war at, that often have low back pain. It's a very common complaint. And they had excellent results in improving function and pain levels, and therefore lowering drug usage um, in that group of people. So the VA system in the United States developed something called the VA Step, Step Care Program, again, in how to address issues like chronic low back pain. And they included yoga as a form of exercise as a non-pharmacologic, pharmacolo oh my gosh, like it's too early for me in this day to say that word, pharmacological choice for addressing back pain. In addition, I will mention that they also included Pilates and Tai Chi as two other alternative options for addressing back pain. And I've, I've listed this uh, study with you so you can actually read more about that if you would like to after the presentation is complete. So it's exciting uh, that yoga helps, but uh, how and why? Uh, so at this point in time, we don't know the specific underlying physiology, but there was a study done in 2010 that compared yoga to simple stretching, and the authors theorized several possible uh, effects of the yoga that might account for why it's so effective. Uh, four different areas. Number one, that the yoga reduces physical impairment by improving strength and flexibility. That yoga positively impacts cognitive appraisal about what's going on by decreasing our fear avoidance and increasing body awareness that yoga positively impacts affect or mood and stress. And we've already mentioned that that's been shown in other studies as well. And that yoga improves neuroendocrine function in particular by normalizing the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. And there's been quite a bit of uh, theorization about this over the years as well. So if we combine those four um, effects, yoga then decreases back pain and improves function overall. And if you want to read more about that, this group of researchers, especially led by Dr. Sherman, <clears throat> has also been one of the most prolific groups on researching back pain. <clears throat> and actually, their studies are also highlighted in the textbook that I mentioned earlier. So really good quality studies coming out of this particular lab. So just to recap, chronic low back pain is the leading cause of pain and disability worldwide. Non-specific lower back pain accounts for 85% of those affected. So the good news is when we create our, our kind of um, 
basic protocols for low back pain, we're going to be addressing the vast majority of people that might show up in your, um, uh, in your, in your clinics uh, with back pain. Yoga has been found to be very effective in addressing pain and dysfunction, typically using a combination of asana, pranayama, and meditation, and almost all the studies cited. And there are actually excellent protocols, like I mentioned, from several studies that can help those uh, of you that are teachers that are maybe newer to working with this population of people in your desire to develop good class pl plans for your students and your clients. So I just wanted to mention before I um, perhaps come back to uh, Akshay and open the floor up for a few other questions that you can learn more about my work um, at uh, my website. You can certainly email me. Don't forget I have this interesting book out there that Akshay was so kind to mention, Yoga for Healthy Aging, and you can certainly order a copy of that. Um, I know that it's now been published in a couple of different languages, so, uh, but those of you that are English uh, readers might enjoy that. And also you can follow me on Facebook and YouTube on my Baxter Bell Yoga page. I mentioned to Akshay that I have a lot of free videos that are available, short little practices. And some of those I've actually um, highlighted as being for back, for back health. So I take some of my movement protocols and I modify them so they're a little bit safer for this group of people. So let me go ahead and um, go ahead and stop sharing the screen so that I can uh, come back and Akshay and I can maybe uh, be on the screen together and talk with you yeah. for a few more moments. Yes, thank you, Dr. Baxter, for a very nice and uh, comprehensive discussion on the re recent research on CLBP or chronic low back pain. And thank you for mentioning Sherman's uh, beautiful work. I think this is the same group that comes from Boston. Uh, I think they might also be in Boston, yeah. So a lot of great work coming out of that area. Yeah, very nice. I was just wondering, uh, I was just wondering my first question to you before I go to the Facebook and pose uh, those uh, comments to you for your feedback and response is uh, when you do this uh, intervention studies or when you used to do this in a pre-COVID area uh, and wh versus when you do kind of tele-yoga intervention, yes. you, first of all, is this happening in the United States? And if it is, what is the difference you are uh, you're noticing in interventions? Well, one of the interesting things for me is I um, hosted a weekly yoga for back health class for the, almost the last 20 years in Oakland. And, you know, it was on a Monday evening after work. So I had a, an equal mixture of men and women, which is different than my other classes, which in the United States are predominantly um, populated by women. Uh, but in that class, because so many men and women experience low back pain, I saw lots of, of men in class, which was, you know, I thought was great that I was finally getting men to try yoga. It was one, a sneaky way to get men to try yoga in the United States. Um, but since the pandemic, I've taken my class online and I've had the ability to actually offer the class twice a week. So I have an early evening class on Tuesday evenings in the United States and I have a, um, a mid-afternoon class on Thursdays. So the wonderful thing is my local students in Oakland are still coming to that class, but I've had people from around the country and even around the world. I have one woman from Australia who comes to class, time difference taken into account. She comes to my evening class where it's a morning in Australia. And so I've actually been able to reach people beyond, far beyond my local community, uh, which, is, which is I have just been loving to have people come in from, from around the world. So I think maybe one of the benefits of the pandemic is a farther reach since so many of us have been forced to go online for this. Just as I'm getting to join you and be a part of your speakers bureau here, um, I'm actually able to reach many more students online. Now, the downside of course is that I, that I can't necessarily have the same visual connection with the students as we're practicing because I have to be demonstrating a little bit more so that I'm sure that they're understanding what I want. So that's the, that's the downside. Uh, but my feedback from folks is that they're feeling very comfortable and safe, that I'm giving them plenty of verbal cues on how to maintain safety as they try the asana portions of practice, and that in general, they're very, very grateful to have the opportunity to continue their practice, especially as you mentioned, because a lot of people are sitting a little bit more than they would normally, and they're having a little bit more achiness in the back, just in general, from the change in activity. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question on the Facebook. Uh, are there any contraindications for the protocols that you showed, which pretty much included Bhujangasana, 
a mountain pose, sphinx pose, a child's pose. Is, can anyone of every, any age and any physiological state do it or would you recommend this not to be done by a certain... That's an excellent question. And the uh, experience from the research that's done is that the vast, vast, vast majority of people um, can safely do these sorts of protocols. I think it's still important if you're working with people individually that you modify practices to meet the person that you're working with. You know, there's not a one size fit all. We don't want to reduce yoga protocols to the idea of antibiotics that everyone just takes basically the same dosage. So I think the wonderful thing about being a yoga therapist or a yoga educator is that we can meet the individual client and, and work with them. And we can fine tune the practice so that it fits them with where they are right now. So perhaps if someone was having a lot of acute back pain in, in, in a, the setting of chronic low back pain, but they were having a flare of pain, they might have to do maybe only one or two of those poses initially. And then as their acute phase started to improve, you could reintroduce all four of those poses as an example. Um, I will mention that in the back of my book, Yoga for Healthy Aging, I do take a lot of health conditions and make some general comments on contraindications. So that's a nice little resource. And you sh uh, people should know that they can get an electronic copy of my book. I believe it's available on Amazon. And then you can, that way you don't have to worry about shipping costs and waiting for your book to arrive for three months. I remember sending books home for when I lived in India for a month in 2005 and I, I shipped all these books home to the United States. And it was a great surprise five months later when they showed up on my doorstep. So I don't want you to have to wait that long. So you can actually get a copy of the book. And that's kind of a nice little chart just to give you some general ideas of postures that you might want to be more careful with, with certain conditions like spinal stenosis and things like that. So is that uh, Yoga for Healthy Aging that you're referring yes. to? Yes. Yeah, the book Yoga for Healthy Aging. In the part two, in the appendix, I actually have one of the appendixes is uh, a list of contraindications or cautions for different health conditions, sure. including different that. sources of back pain. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, what do you think of uh, people who are on uh, you know, anti-pain drugs? Uh, is that not a problem for you to you know, handle them because they may overstretch and do over asanas more than what they want because they're on analgesics. I find that in general, the people that come to my class that are on a standardized regimen, they've been taking a certain amount of medication regularly for a while, those people are also fairly cautious about movement because they've had this chronic pain condition and they know that sometimes if they're not careful, the smallest thing can set them back and require that they have to maybe increase their medication use for a while. So I find in general that most of my students who are also using medication to help them deal with a chronic pain condition are, are actually the most cautious students that I have. So uh, on rare occasion, there will be someone that overdoes it and doesn't, you know, maybe they were over medicated and they thought they could do just about anything. But that's the exception as opposed to the rule. Most of my students, I don't really feel like I have to worry so much about that. And, you know, I'm very clear in regularly giving them cautions as we practice and asking them to listen to the feedback of their body instead of looking at the form that I'm showing them so that, it, that they're actually getting, you know, the physiologic feedback from their nerve receptors back to their brain saying, oh, this is a little more intense in the lower back, or oh, your hamstring is feeling a little bit of cramping, so that they're actually taking that into account and they're letting that be their guide versus their ego trying to make them master a bunch of new yoga poses. So uh, is this a no-no to the spinal cord injury related pain? Um, in terms of teaching yoga asana? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's a, there's a teacher in the United States named Matt Sandifer. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he suffered a spinal cord injury at age 17 in a, a car accident, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. And he spent many, many years not taking good care of himself, uh, being very depressed and angry with his uh, lot in life that he had been, that he had to suffer this injury. And at a certain point, he discovered yoga. And even though he can't uh, mentally instruct his legs to move, he's actually developed a whole approach 
to asana in his particular situation. And now he's a great inspiration in the accessible yoga movement in the United States, accessible, making yoga accessible to people with lots of disabilities in particular. And I've actually had the pleasure of meeting Matt and working in a, uh, assisting in a workshop that he did. And basically, again, when one approaches the individual and takes into account what they are dealing with and honoring that, you, we can usually find a way to design a practice for almost everyone, including people that might have spinal cord injuries. So you do a lot of customization based on people's requirements and Absolutely. In, in fact, you know, in the United States and internationally now, with the guidelines developed by the International Association of Yoga Therapy uh, and, and the educational standards that they developed over the last 10 years, um, it's very clear that yoga therapy, if we're going to be doing yoga therapy in particular, using that terminology, uh, that we're actually individualizing the practice for each person that we meet when work with. And Absolutely. You're, and you're one of the certified IAYT uh, that's yoga right. Isn't that yeah, true? there's about 4,000 people around the world now that have that have achieved that level of education. There are over 50 schools internationally now that are accredited by IYT, um, and I know there's a process now that's evolving in India that's similar to what's been going on <clears throat> internationally with IYT. Um, so that uh, you know that if people are interested in learning more about that, please check out IYT.org, the website. Uh, for the organization, there's lots of great information for just a casual visitor yeah. to learn Thank more about that. Thank you for letting the reviewers mm -hmm. know about the importance that the IOIT and the India's Quality Council of India is uh, paying or is according to the importance the importance of credibility and the importance of uh, yeah. quality itself. So that's very, very important. So let's move yeah. to another viewer on the Facebook, uh, Spurthi Pujari. She is thanking you for your talk and asks, how does you manage the safety of patients in an online session and also are they already ex are there are there already existing patients before covid who have taken your session and uh, if you how are you handling them if you could get some more light on it this is the question sure yeah so it, it, the challenge again in the online setting is i'm not physically in the room with my students where I can very quickly scan the room and see what's going on. So one of the things I will often do is um, I will keep a certain group of students on my screen off to one side so that, um, and I ask folks if they would need any special attention um, or if they have any particular concerns at the beginning of class. And if they do, I can then highlight that person and keep a closer look. So with the Zoom that I use, I use the Zoom program for my classes. I can actually highlight, I can choose to spotlight an individual, even though I might be the person on the screen for everybody else. So I can actually keep an eye on an individual. And it's, I, I've been, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions with my students also, uh, in which I can actually have them show me how they're doing their poses at home. Um, and I can gain a lot of information um, by doing that. And I can have them you know, shift their body position if I need to get more of a three-dimensional experience of that. So there's a couple different ways I think that you can do that. Um, I try to get good feedback from the students at the end of class. And what I will mention is that I rarely have anyone leave a session before it's over. So um, I would say almost invariably, usually people tell me that they have to leave class early if they're going to do so. And I, all, I ask people to leave a little um, uh, note in the chat box if they had to go for a particular reason, right? So I found that that people just aren't leaving because they start to feel poorly during class. And I always stick around for a few minutes at the end of class and I open up the floor for any questions or concerns that people had. And, you know, as a rule, folks are doing great. Every once in a while they want a little more information about how to do one of the poses a little more clearly. But other than that, I found that the acceptance of the instruction online has been really very, very high. And I've had very few difficulties with my students. Great. And, oh, and also, although most of the students are regular students that have been studying with me for a while, I also often have one or two brand new students to class joining me. Um, so, you know, that's also been encouraging that the new students are finding the delivery of the information effective enough with this tool that we're required to use right now, at least for a little while longer, 
that my level of fear or worry around uh, people having trouble has been greatly diminished. Thank you for letting us know. Our final question uh, from my side uh, is to you about what's happening in the United States with relation to the integrative health care. You, uh, you mentioned the Sherman's group and so many research studies and the IAYT-led uh, accreditation program. Now, how is the US medical community looking at yoga integration in the healthcare delivery at both the urban localities as well as rural communities? I think this is happening much more, I mean, rurally, there's a lot more telemedicine being offered where there's distance visits online with, uh, with, uh, with practitioners. Uh, however, I'm not really, I, I'm not uh, well versed in what's happening uh, in, the, in the rural areas in terms of integrative approaches to healthcare. Uh, slowly but surely, there is more and more discussion and evolution of practices that involve a team approach integrating not only Western allopathic uh, tools, but also yoga therapeutic tools. So you, uh, we're seeing more often that yoga therapists are being brought on board in hospital settings and in multi-specialty clinic settings um, as part of a team approach to healthcare, as well as massage therapists, uh, acupuncturists, and, and those sorts of um, therapeutic options for, for clients. So it's certainly not a huge wave of shift, but there is a gradual shift. And I think what people are realizing is that on some level, it's much more cost of effective to have this integrative approach than it is to have this shotgun approach where you have the primary care doctor continuously sending the individual out to other places and other individuals and then waiting for information to trickle back in. When we have these integrative clinics, the team of practitioners will often meet and, and talk about the individual client, the individual patient, and so it's much more efficient in sharing information and developing a much more agile and uh, um, responsive way of approaching the individual's health and also being able to actually um, form a team uh, or a, uh, an integrated team approach with the individual. So the, team, the individual feels like they're part of the team as well, the client, the, the, the patient. So that is happening, uh, slow but sure. Um, I don't know what's happening in India, but I hope that's maybe another edge of growth that's happening there as well. Yeah, just likewise in India too, the national education policy advocates the integrative health education at the education level and all the All India Institutes of Medical Sciences being put up in different places of India have to have an Ayush center or a department, you know, Ayush stands for Ayurveda, Yunani, Yoga, Siddha, uh, uh -huh. and the homeopathy as a part and parcel of the faculty of a medical institute. But the good thing about Great. this is also, as you mentioned, the patient themselves are demanding. And as you said, they feel they're part of it, as you said, in, you know, in yeah. your, when they work, they are addressed in an integrated fashion, they feel more euphoric, more attended to. And uh, this is also good for research because if the co-local, if there is co-location of yoga therapists with the, the Western allopathic system or the Ayurveda, there's going to be more data, for example, CLBP being treated by a certain allopathic system uh, with uh, and another group with allopathic system plus yoga therapy, so you, you're more likely to have more data of the comparison between two groups, or what we call the comparative effect, effectiveness. And that data is going to feed further into rolling out the integrative health model globally as a global village, as a global patient or whatever you call it. So a lot of yes. activity is happening. I think COVID has taught both in the United States and in India, the largest democracies, the value of preventive health care, the value of cost effectiveness and the value of uh, addressing an untreatability and uh, failed clinical trials in most of the no lifestyle disorders. Yes, so it is such a pleasure to host you, to have you with us in this program. Uh, we hope to reconnect again and thank you for uh, also for enlightening uh, the viewers about the ins and outs of yoga therapy, the online sessions, as well as the patient-centric approach and all that you talked about uh, in the beautiful slides of latest studies in CLBP or the chronic low back pain. So hope to reconnect again. And if you have yes. a final message, you can tell now and then we'll. It's, it's just a delight to join you again and please reach out and I would love to meet your community and share more information down the road. So thanks for having me and mm -hmm. be well, everyone. Wash those hands, wear those masks and 
Uh, yeah. I'll ho hopefully, maybe the next time I see you, we'll be out of quarantine and we can all be roaming around with less concern and fear and greater joy. Thank you, everyone. Thank Namaste. You.